Hello and welcome to this presentation on optimizing nickel queries with Visual Explain. My name is Marco Greco and I am a principal software engineer in the nickel team based in London, UK. Hi, uh, my name is Bingji Miao. Um, I'm also a principal software engineer in the nickel team and I'm based in Denver, Colorado. This presentation is divided in two parts and I will be covering the first four sections um, covering explain, um, so the output of the explain um, statement, operators and diagnosing and improving queries with metrics and profiling. And I'll be covering the second half which includes various aspects of uh, query, optimization, query optimization topics including index pushdown, join methods, join ordering, and the index advisor. The first thing one needs to do in order to optimize a statement is to get the query plan. This is done with the uh, explained statement um, whose output is a JSON document with a sequence of steps. The steps are represented by items called um, operators. Um, which describe every single action that needs to be done. The visual explain um, is implemented in the um, query tab and uh, executes an explain statement behind the scenes in order to um, get the explain, get the plan. So what you do is you type your statement in the query editor hits the explain button and lo and behold in the query results you get a visual representation of the plan. The UI is actually quite nice in that respect in that you can turn um, those um, operators around with the uh, four arrows um, under the plan button that you can see there, zoom in and out um, and it's in general terms much more readable than a JSON document. You have other ways to access the plans which are quite interesting because you can, uh, if you want, um, have a look at the plan of uh, a statement that's already been prepared and you do that um, with a select star method of plan from system prepared. Um, in a similar way, you can also see the plan of uh, an executing uh, request via the system key space. Um, called active requests and for those requests that are executed for quite a long time and are stored in the completed requests system key space, you can do exactly the same. So what are these operators? As we said before, each operator represents a step in the execution of the query plan. So um, a scan operator uh, performs an index scan. In fact, we do have um, quite a number of scan operators. Fetch gets documents from the KV. Um, the projection assembles the um, list of expressions that are part of the result. So when you do a select field one, field two uh, from uh, key space one, field one, field two, is, the, uh, is called the projection and the projection operator assembles that. And the one thing that you need to bear in mind that while some operators actually perform actions, other operators are just orchestrators. So what they do is they set up um, a sequence uh, of lists of actions. So for instance, the sequence operator um, sets up a, a sequence parallel will take an operator like a fetch and uh, instantiate multiple um, copies and execute them in parallel. Interesting thing about operators is that there are two types. One is the plan operators that we have um, discussed so far and those are a blueprint for the request and the other type is the execution operator. What happens at execution time is that um, a step called instantiation takes the plan, goes through the plan, um, takes every single plan operator and builds um, an execution operator modeled on that one. So you can see the plan as a blueprint 
for the request while each individual instantiation is uh, an actual um, request. Uh, much like you've got a blueprint for a car and then you follow the blueprint and produce individual items in the form of um, cars. The uh, list of execution operators is known as execution tree and as, as we said, um, Nickel takes uh, a plan, goes through it and through the instantiation um, phase uh, produces an execution tree. Now, there is a one-to-one -one relationship in between um, execution operators and plan operators, but there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship in between a plan and the execution tree. Meaning that um, during the instantiation phase, some operators will be added. So for instance, the authorized operator, the stream operator, these are not really steps um, needed to um, implement the plan, but they're needed for uh, the actual execution. And other operators might be optimized away. So if there is one sequence with just one step, you will not see the sequence um, in the final instantiation. Why do we care about um, execution trees? We care about execution trees and actually being able to read them because they contain the profiles for the actual ex execution of that actual statement. So by having a look at the profiles, you can determine what part of the plan is not uh, going according to plan. The issue with uh, the execution trees though is that they only exist after instantiation. And basically that requires that a statement has executed. So they're only accessible after you've done the statement um, and uh, or at least while you're running it, if you're um, having a look at uh, a runaway query which uh, is executing via the um, system key space, system active request key space. The other way to have a look at uh, execution trees is through the visual explain. Um, if we go back to what we were doing before, so it puts, putting our query in the query editor, rather than hitting explain, we now hit execute. And at the end of the execution in the query results, we actually hit the, uh, we actually get the results. Now hit the plan button, you now get the plan, but it's no longer the plan, it's actually the uh, execution tree with the profiling. And um, that contains actual execution times for each individual operator and it's um, even color coded, meaning that green stuff is going um, well, the yellow stuff not so much. So um, just for completeness, uh, going back to the uh, profiles, at the end of the request, um, the request output um, after the metrics does contain the profile and the profile contains uh, execution timings. And they are, again, a plan, except that this time we do have a stats field for each operator and that stat field con contains um, interesting information. Skip to a metric for a second. Um, so the metric you see uh, in the UI and you see at the end of uh, the execution of a request and contains um, a few pieces of information. In the main result information, um, execution time information and the number of mutations. You can use all of those to assess the performance of your statement um, and some of them are easy enough to comprehend but some not so much. So why do we have an elapsed time versus an execution time? The elapsed time is the time that, um, that it takes from receiving the request to actually completing the execution, while the execution time is the time that it takes from starting the execution. In general terms, they're not too different. But if your service is overloaded and the nickel kernel takes time to find free services to execute the request, then that's when the elapsed time becomes interesting. 
when you see an elapsed time that's much higher than an execution time, uh, that's a sign of a overloaded nickel service. The other thing that you have to bear in mind is that time is relative. Depending on the system load, the execution time of a request will increase. Meaning that if you have uh, a system that's not executing anything and you've got cores available to run all the uh, operators in parallel, this will take a fair amount of time. As there are more requests running and um, more operators want to run at the same time, the nickel kernel will have to switch in between those and the execution time, even though you've got available services and requests are not being queued, individual times will take more. So you can happily add, go from a, an execution time to twice as much on a fully loaded system where by fully loaded meaning uh, we mean um, a system that has got as many requests executing as we have services. Once you go beyond the um, number of services, requests will be queued. And this is when the time, the elapsed time will start to increase. So the point here is that if you see a request that is executing beyond what you expect, don't necessarily attribute that to a bad plan. It could be just a system that's being loaded. We touch now the profiles. Um, the um, profile, as we said, is, a, is the representation of an execution tree. And what it does is it contains an extra field which is called stats with some interesting um, items. You've got items count, you've got uh, some um, execution times, uh, the state and phase switches. The items in and out are the number of items that a, each individual operator receives um, if it's a consumer and produces if it is a producer. So for instance, scans are just producers, they don't receive anything and they only have items out. The fetch will receive a key and produce a document. The um, times are the actual execution time for this operator, so spent on CPU. Service time is any time spent waiting for services. Uh, so like um, the scan is waiting for the indexer, the fetch is waiting for the KV, um, and the kernel time is time spent waiting for the kernel to um, schedule this particular um, operator. Now the kernel time is actually affected by two things. One, waiting to send um, documents or receive documents. So we're waiting on uh, some other uh, operator upstream or downstream. The other um, thing that uh, impacts kernel time is a load of kernel, as we were saying. So literally, we have got the ability to execute, but there isn't any other um, core available for us to run. Last two things, um, phase switches is the number of times an operator has switched from one state to another. And the state uh, is the actual state of the operator at this moment in time. Now this only applies to system active requests. So this only applies if you're having a look at profile information of running requests or anything else, you don't see a state. And again, the state is services kernel running uh, depending on um, what the um, operator is doing. So Visual Explain um, essentially provides the profile information for each operator um, as shown here. All you have to do is go to the operator of uh, interest, click on it and you get a pop-up window with, um, with the profile. How do we use profiles? Well, there are several things that you can have uh, a look at. For instance, if you start having a look at times, um, high kernel time means that either we're not running because of our overloaded system or 
somewhere down the line, a consumer operator is not reading our results fast enough. And therefore, we have to wait to produce more um, uh, values. Service times, um, that means um, a service that's uh, under load. So for instance, the KV is not producing, um, is not producing um, documents fast enough. The indexer is not producing uh, keys fast enough um, and all that kind of stuff. If you've got um, a number of documents produced that's quite high, that is in general terms an indication of uh, a suboptimal index being used. If you've got um, ex high execution time, in particular for filter, that is uh, a suboptimal filter, meaning um, you've chosen an index or the, the optimizer have chosen an index that's not appropriate and the filter is having to test an awful lot of documents because most of the documents or most of the keys provided are not really uh, part of the um, active set that we're interested in. Now, you can also um, use um, profiling information in more complex ways. So for instance, you can, for the fetch operator, take the service time and divide it by items out. If that works out to be quite high, that means that the um, latency for each get is quite high. And you know, you could use similar, similar arguments for scans and joins. You can also use profile information for debugging. So if you have a look at system uh, active requests, you have a look at an operator and you do it repeatedly and you see that the state is not changing, then what happens is that operator is, um, is stuck. If you have a look at face switches and there's a low rate of change, literally that means that the kernel is not giving that operator um, enough uh, opportunities to run and that could be very well uh, a, a sign of a service that is um, overloaded. And with this I will hand it to uh, Benji. Thanks Marco. Um, so Marco just discussed um, the basics of explain and major explain and discussed how to use metrics and profiling information in trying to diagnose your query or part of the query that's running suboptimally. I'm gonna switch gear a little bit and start talking about a few topics in uh, optimizing your query to make them run faster. So the first such topic is the index pushdown. Um, index pushdown uh, was first introduced in Couchbase Server version 5.5. And what it is, is the ability to push down certain operations to the indexer node to improve query performance. So the architecture of Couchbase has a nickel node and the indexer node as ser uh, separate services, which just means that they are actually uh, different parts of the server, although in the vast majority of times you want to use them together. So what typically happens is when the nickel node or the query node received a query, the planner will generate a plan, um, and if the plan involves index scan, it will send what's called index span information to the indexer. The indexer is then performing the index uh, scan itself, and then it returns the information from the index scan to the query node. The query node, after receiving those information, then performs any further operations uh, such as uh, maybe a fetch is needed to the KV to get active documents, or it can be applying filters, additional filters to the documents, or it can be per, uh, performing operations such like group by, ordering, limit and offsets, and so on and so forth. So that's the typical flow of um, how a query is being executed. What the index pushdown does is for a subset of the queries, it will try to push some of the operations to the indexer node. And the operations that can be pushed down includes a grouping operation, group by, a sort or the order operation, a limit, and offset. Those are the pagination uh, options for a query. So why do we want to do this? Um, if we can perform certain operations in the indexer node, 
then hopefully that will greatly reduce the amount of traffic in between the index node and the query node. And that will um, in, can have the potential of greatly improve your query performance. So for this to work, the index bands must be exact. Um, so the, as mentioned, the index bands are the information the query nodes sends to the indexer nodes to perform the actual index scan. So exact here just means there's no false positives, which means um, there cannot be any um, additional steps in the query node after the indexer has performed its uh, operation. So false positives are things like, you know, if you have um, the indexer returns um, a number of keys, index keys, or documents, um, not the documents, but the keys and the uh, index key information, then the query node cannot be applying any other operations that throw away a subset of those keys. If it does that, then because the uh, operations such as sorting or grouping is done at the indexer, if we throw away um, a subset of the keys, then that make those operations performed at index node invalid. So that's why um, for this to work, for the index push time to work, the index bands generated must be exact. And this is actually indicated in the um, explain itself as we will see in a minute. Another uh, requirement is that all the work clause predicates must be evaluated by the index. Um, this is for the same reason. If you have only a subset of the predicates and the query node is evaluating the rest of the predicates, then again, it has the potential of throw away the information that's returned from the index which in turn makes the operations, the grouping, the sorting, and whatever, operations performed by the index are invalid. So again, uh, for this to work, all of the basically all of the operations must be performed at the index or node itself. Another requirement is uh, we cannot have any intersect scans or union scans, which means we cannot have multiple index scans for this to work. Um, the entire query must have a single index scan. Again, for the same um, reason, we cannot invalid, invalidate the information returned by the index scan by any other means. And in the same vein, uh, we cannot have any joins because um, joins has the potential of, again, changing the information returned from the indexer. So with regard to joins, there is one caveat in that. So of the Operations that can be pushed down to the indexer, sort or ordering is sort of special uh, in a way that we can have joins and still have sort to be pushed down to the indexer. But that's a special case. In general, we don't support index push down when you have join operations. So here's an example index. We create an index on the travel sample bucket, which is the default sampling, one of the default sample buckets shipped with the Couchbase server. So this index we're just creating on the city field of the travel cycle documents. And the city field is, uh, the index is created on an ascending order, which is the default. So the first of the pushdowns covered is going to be pagination pushdown. Pagination in nickel is achieved by the limit and offset uh, clauses of the, your query. So here's an example query, uh, select star from travel sample where city equals San Francisco, an offset 4,000 and limit 10,000. So we're um, looking for the documents in a bucket where it has the city field of San Francisco and we have an offset of limit specified for the query. So on the right hand side of the slide, you will see a query explain or video explain. And one of the nodes is index scan three. If you click on the index three nodes, you will see uh, an, a whole bunch of information for the index scan. And uh, a couple of fields in that you see limit 10,000 and offset 4,000. So when you see this, um, these two fields, that means the limit and the offset operation is being pushed down to the index scan. And when it's being pushed down to the index scan, then we don't need to perform the offset and the limit operation at a query node or nickel node anymore. Um, another operation that can be pushed down to the indexer is the ordering or 
Um, the example query here, uh, we are selecting city from travel sample, where city like San um, followed by a percent. Uh, so you're looking for any city name that start with San, like San Francisco, San Diego, and so on and so forth. And then you have order by clause, order by city. So when you look at the explain uh, or the video explain, which is at the bottom of the slide, you see from the right hand, from right to left, you see index scan, a filter, a project, but you don't see um, a sort operator. Normally when you have an order by clause in your query, you will see a sort operator that performs the actual sorting that uh, provides the order specified by the order by. But in this case, we don't have it. And what's happening is, if you click on the index scan three operator, and that's shown now on the right hand side of this slide, you see again a number of uh, information related to the index scan. And one of them you see in the middle somewhere there that says index order with a key position of a zero. Key position just uh, indicates the position of the key. So zero just means it's the first index key, is zero based indexing. In this index, if you remember, it only has a single index key uh, on the city. Um, so this says that the index ordering is on the city field. So the index, when you perform the index scan, the index actually provides the ordering. And that's why we don't need to use a separate order operator to get you the order. The index scan itself is providing the ordering required by the query. So for the order pushdown, the order by clause must matches the order of the leading index key in terms of either ascending or descending. So in the example query here, if you have the same query, but now you're requiring or your order by clause says city descending, then we could not use the original index defined to satisfy the order by because the original index defined the city as in ascending order and we currently don't support reverse index scan in order to uh, satisfy the order. Um, so if, if you use the original index and you give this query, then we will need to perform, the nickel node will need to perform an uh, sort operation to give you the order uh, required by the order by clause. You can, however, change the original index definition such that the uh, index key is defined in descending order and if you do that, then again, we'll be able to use our index pushdown to satisfy the order by clause by the index. So this again, just stresses the point that for the order pushdown, the index key ordering must exactly match the order by clause. Um, the second uh, point is uh, you can actually do pagination pushdown and order pushdown at the same time. So for example, the query here, you are selecting city from travel sample again, uh, order by city, but now you provide, uh, or the query asks for offset of 20 and limit of 100. So for this one, if you look at the uh, explain, the individual explain on the right hand side of the slide, again, if you click on index scan three, you will see um, the detailed information of the index scan. And in there, you will see um, the index order information, again, a key position of zero. That means the index scan is providing ordering. You will also see both limit and offset. So limit 100 and offset 20. So all of this is part of the index scan three. That means both the order and the pagination, the limit and offset, are being pushed down to the index. So the index can have multiple pushdowns at the same time. Another um, aspect of index pushdown on another, on another operation that can be pushed down to the indexer is aggregation. So uh, for example, the, the query here, we're selecting the count of cities as number of cities from travel sample where city is not null. So in this case, uh, normally when you have a count or any kinds of aggregate functions in the query uh, explain, on the visual explain, you will see a group operator that's uh, needed to perform either group by or the aggregation or both. But in this case, if you look at the, the visual explain, you see the index scan and the project 
but you don't see any group operator. So the reason being, uh, in this case, the evaluation of the aggregate function is also being pushed down to the index scan. So again, if you click on the index scan operator itself, uh, on the right-hand side of um, the slide, you will see the detailed information for index scan three. And in there, you will see something new called index group X. And under there, you'll see aggregates, and the aggregate information is count. So that tells you the count, because you're selecting count uh, in your query. The count operation is actually being performed in the indexer itself, in the index scan. And it also gives you the uh, expression, uh, which is um, the city field of travel sample. So it tells you what the count is being operated on. And again, the key position is zero. That just means uh, where performing this account operation on the leading index key. So again, this is an example of performing aggregation functions as part of the index scan. So the kind of uh, aggregation functions that can be pushed down are count, min, max, sum, et cetera. Um, we also support distinct operation. So if you do a count distinct of city, as in the example query here, um, the, if you look at the, the um, visual explain again for index scan three, you see the same index group X uh, section of the index scan. And in there you see the aggregates is count again, because that's what you're asking for. But in addition to the information we just saw, we also see something new in the middle there, it says distinct to be true. That means the count operation is operating on the distinct of the index key, uh, in this case city. That just means uh, the indexer is going to first remove duplicates before it performs the aggregate function, the count here. So, so far I only gives you very simple examples of index pushdown. This is really just give you an idea of what it is. Um, so I have here a link to a documentation page that gives a little bit more information on index pushdowns. Um, I did not discuss a uh, group by pushdown. There's something called partial group pushdown. That means uh, when you have group by clause, it's possible for the indexer to perform uh, a partial aggregation and then the query node will uh, finish the actual aggregation. So you, can, you should be able to find more information um, on that um, in the link, as well as uh, I also did not discuss more complicated scenarios like what happens when you have a composite index when you ha um, have multiple index keys, for example. But again, this is uh, just to give you sort of a flavor of what it is. And uh, if you can take advantage of index pushdown, that again has the potential of significantly improve your query performance. So that's the first topic. Uh, the next topic I'm going to discuss is a join method. Um, so uh, Couchbase or the Nickel Query Engine start to support NC join in version 5.5. And we support two join methods for NC join. Uh, we support nested loop join and hash join. Um, hash join is uh, supported only in uh, enterprise edition. So for community edition, only nested loop join is supported. But assuming you are using the enterprise edition, then you have a choice of these two join methods. So of the two, nested loop join is the default join methods. Um, and nested loop join, if you want to use it, it requires an appropriate secondary index on the inner side of the join. So I'm going to be using travel sample again as an example here. So I'm going to uh, create two indexes here. Uh, the first index is created on the AirPod documents inside Travel Sample, and it's going to be uh, created on the city and the country fields of airports. The second index here is created on the route documents of Travel Sample, and it's going to be created on the source AirPod field of all the routes. So I'm going to discuss nest and loop join first. So here's an example query. Um, so if you look at the query, the from clause has two, uh, has one, a single join uh, and has two sides. The left hand side of the join is airport and the right hand side join uh, is a route. And the on clause specified a join condition. Um, so I'm joining airport.faa 
to the source airport of the route. Uh, remember we said uh, for an SLU loop join, the right-hand side of the join need to have an appropriate second index. So in the previous slide, if you remember, we created um, an index on the source airport of the route documents, and that's going to be used here. Uh, so the on clause has that condition as well as any predicates on the route itself. Um, so that's sort of just a convention when you specify a join, you want to specify the predicates on the right hand side of the join on the on clause and the where clause should contain filters on the left hand side of the join, in this case airports. Um, the reason you want to do this is in case you have an outer join, um, if you specify the uh, the predicates on the right hand side of the outer join the work clause that might change the, um, the semantics of the query. The reason being the work clause is um, in theory or in principle should be evaluated after the join. So if you have predicates on the right hand side of join, that might turn the outer join into an inner join. Again, that will change the semantics of the query. So just as sort of a, a, a principle when you specify a join, especially outer joins, you want to specify the predicates on the right hand side of the join on the on clause and the predicates on the left hand side of the join on the, in the where clause, as I did here. So I'm joining again airports with route and the where clause says um, I'm looking for a specific airport on the San Jose airport and I'm looking for a matching FAA with the source airport of the route, and I'm looking for the uh, projection list giving me the destination. So I'm basically looking for what um, you know, routes exist between San Jose and what other destination. So if you look at the, uh, the video explain at the bottom half of the slides, um, so, the, um, so there's going to be a Nessa loop join in the middle of the plan. Um, Again, that's the default join methods, and it has two input to the Nessa loop join. The top half is the left hand side of the join, so we'll have an index scan and followed by a fetch. So we're scanning the index on city and country from the airport side, that's on the top. And then on the bottom there, I also have an index scan and a fetch, and that's accessing the route documents from Travel Summit. So now, um, if you, I change the query slightly, um, so you notice the query no longer has the predicates on San Jose. So I'm not looking for a specific airport anymore. I'm looking for sort of all the airports. Um, so this is going to be a, um, a larger query in the sense that this query will probably execute much longer than the previous query because there's more work to do. So if you um, look at the right-hand side of the join, uh, of the slide, um, we click on this a loop join and we're looking at the profiling information as uh, discussed by Marco. So you notice for Nessa loop join, the items in is uh, 1968, so just under 2,000 documents coming from the left-hand side of the join. And the items out is, um, a larger number, uh, 17,222. So as we said, this is going to be our larger join now. And if you look at the exact time of the stats section, this uh, a query executed in about 1.2 seconds. So it runs longer. So this is a situation where we say, okay, the, um, the join is performing more work um, and Nessa loop join is taking over a second to execute. This might be in a situation where we say, let's try whether hash join is going to be performing better for this particular join. So for hash join, uh, we said uh, hash join is only available in enterprise edition. And by default, hash join is not currently being considered unless you use something called a join hint, specifically a used hash hint. So if you look at the query, um, it's the query where um, yeah, the same as the previous slide, except in the blue part here, we have something uh, called use hash and then in parentheses probe uh, specified after route. So route is the right-hand side of the join being performed. So where specify what's called a use hash hint, 
on route, which is uh, again, the right-hand side of the drawing. So when we do this, what we're saying is, we tell the planner that we want to use a hash join for this particular join. And uh, in addition, we want to, um, the right-hand side of the join, which is route here, to be the probe side of the hash join. So the way hash join works is we build uh, an in-memory hash table from one side of the join or the build side. And then we um, use the probe side to probe the hash table to perform the actual join itself. So that's the two sides of a hash join. And when you specify a use hash hint, you want to specify whether you want the side to be either the build side or the probe side. So now if you look at the uh, explain here, this looks very similar to the previous visual explain, except the middle part, the middle operator here, it says hash join instead of a nested loop join. And, and the input, again, there are two inputs that looks um, almost exactly the same as the previous um, explain. So the only difference is by using the use hash probe hint, we're telling the, the planner to um, use a hash join instead of nested loop join, which again, nested loop join is the default join method. So by doing this, you can say, uh, you can see whether hash join is uh, running faster than nested loop join. So this is, especially when you have a long running query, uh, we have a join query that's running pretty long, you can try to uh, use the uh, use hash hint to see whether that helps in your query to make it run faster. So the join hint can only be specified on the right-hand side of the join, as we show in example. Um, there are two hash, uh, uh, there are two join hints. You can either do use hash or use NL. NL just means nested loop join. You don't have to use that because uh, nested loop join, again, is the default join method, uh, but you can to um, you know, be explicit. And the use hash hint, as we discussed, has two variants. Um, so use hash followed by a parenthesis. You need to specify either the build side or the probe side. Uh, for the hash join. So hash join is beneficial for large joins. So large is just defined as, you know, you, you're going to be doing uh, more work um, and the run, uh, the query is going to run longer. So in those case situations, you might want to try hash join to see whether that helps or not. And when you're using hash join, you want to pick the smaller side of the, uh, to be the build side of the hash join. And this is because um, one difference between a hash join and a loop join is that hash join uses more memory because of the in-memory hash table you need to use. So when you do hash join, you want to pick the smaller side to be the build side to minimize uh, additional memory usage. And this is in case where you have a large number of queries running. And if a lot of them are using hash joins, you'll notice the memory consumption of the query node is going to be increasing. So you want to pick the smaller side to, to be the build side of hash join. Okay, so that uh, was uh, the discussion on join methods. Uh, the next topic is join ordering. So, so we want to discuss this because currently, uh, as it stands now, Nickel Query Engine does not yet support reorder joins. What that means is when your query has a join, we're going to be performing the join in the order that you specify it in the query. So in the future, we're going to be changing this and allow uh, join reordering. Uh, when that happens, then this is not as big of an issue because we're going to be able to do it automatically for you. But for now, since we don't support that yet, you need to be aware that join order can have a significant impact on query performance. And uh, I put sort of the, the, the key take home message here is to, you want to put the smaller of the join side of the join on the left hand side of the join. This is especially true for nested loop joins. So I have two queries here. Um, it's uh, more or less the same query, except I specify differently in terms of uh, join ordering. So this is uh, kind of the same query as uh, I, the first query I used for the previous section. So I'm joining airport with route. 
and I'm looking for uh, specifically the San Jose airport. Um, so that should be only a single airport. And I'm looking for where does the routes take from San Jose, what other destination can it reach? Um, the second query here is uh, almost exactly the same, except now the route is specified on the left-hand side of the joint, and airport is specified on the right-hand side of the joint. So these two queries are equivalent in the sense that semantically, they should give you the same result back, uh, but the execution of these two queries are significantly different. So let's look at the first query first. So when I have airport on the left-hand side of the joint and route on the right-hand side of the joint, if you look at the um, stats or the profiling information of Nestle Loop joint, um, well, in this query, I did not specify any use hash hint. So by default, it's going to be using Nestle Loop joint. And if you look at the details, items in is one, uh, as we expected, there's only one San Jose airport and items out is 59. So the left side join has produces one document and the entire join produces 59 results. Um, and if you look at the exact time here, um, the query runs in uh, 4.6 milliseconds. In contrast, if you look at the second query, which again should be equivalent, except now route is on the left hand side and airport is on the right hand side. So again, Nestle Loop Join is being used. And if you look at the profiling information for Nestle Loop Join, you see items in now is 24,024. So much larger than one. And items out is 59. So we're producing the same results. But they, if you look at the exact time now, uh, the, the query executes in 2.28 or you know, 2 point, almost 2.3 seconds. Um, in contrast to about you know, less than five milliseconds. So there is a significant performance difference and the only difference in these two queries is um, in the second query, I'm using the larger side of the join on the left hand side and the smaller on the right hand side. And they just make the same query a whole lot less efficient. So again, this is something that's sort of a current limitation we have. Uh, we don't support join reordering. So you know you need to be a little aware of when you specify a join, you want to uh, try to put a smaller uh, side of the join on the left hand side. Um, this is especially true when you have a long running query. So you want to uh, examine, you know, the previous section we talked about. You want to uh, experiment with hash join um, instead of nested loop join. And in this section, I just uh, discussed, you, know, you want to examine the join order to make sure if you're using Nestle loop join, you want to put the smaller side of the join on the left hand side. That should improve your query performance. Okay, so the last topic I'm going to cover briefly uh, is uh, advice statement or the index advisor. So index advisor uh, is introduced in Couchbase Server 6.5. Um, so if you look at the, um, at the query workbench, um, there is a new advice button right next to the execute and explain button. So what this does is uh, given a specific query you typed in in the query editor, the advice um, button can um, give you advice in terms of what indexes you can potentially improve your query performance. So as you can see, I'm having the same query here as I used in the previous sections, except in this case, I did not uh, create the two indexes that I uh, introduced to uh, allow the query to run in the uh, previous sections. So now the only index available I have is on the type field of travel sample. So in this case, the query is going to run very slowly. Um, it actually timed out for me in this case. Um, so when I press the advice button, so this is the output of the advice. So the first section, it tells you um, the, cur the currently used index. This is what the query is currently using. So it says I only have the type index created. So it's telling me I'm using this type index. Um, it gives me the same information twice. This is not a bug. That's because I have a join in this query. So it gives me the index used on the left-hand side of join, 
and the index used on the right hand side of join, it just happened to be the same index. So after that, it gives me uh, index recommendations and there are two sections. The first one is called cover index recommendations. So this is in case you want to create a cover index for this particular query. So cover index, you should all know that, you know, if you have a cover index, that should be good for your query because then it avoids an extra trip to the KV node. So that, that's good. Um, so in this case, it gives me two cover index recommendations one for airport and one for route. Again, one for the left-hand side and one for the right-hand side. Um, and then on the bottom, it also gives me just a regular index recommendation. So these are not common indexes. So the one potential disadvantage of common index is that it takes more space in the indexer node. So if that's going to be an issue, so you can try to follow the index, just the regular index recommendations, uh, that should still uh, be uh, good for your query, uh, although may not be as good as the cover indexes. So in this, is, uh, in this case, it actually gives me the two indexes that I actually created uh, in the beginning of uh, the previous sections that I have. So I'm not going to go through the index advisor in much more detail. There's going to be a separate presentation on this. So if you're interested, make sure you uh, attend that session as well. So that's all the information we covered. Uh, hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, there is going to be, um, I believe, a discussion forum uh, for this session. And so if you have questions, feel free to post in that forum. Uh, you can also try to contact either Marco and I uh, directly, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you very much.